What is up, what is up? All right, guys, if we can make our way to our seats, we're about to get going here. How's everybody doing today? So not so good. How's everybody doing today? There we go, there we go, there we go. Um, guys, this weekend, once again, is gonna be an incredible weekend. We're really looking forward to it. We're so glad y'all are here. Uh, on the count of three, just tell me who you're looking forward to seeing most this weekend. One, two, three. Great, I heard, I heard me mostly. Uh, I am Caleb, I'm M MC in the event. Thank you, thank you so much, I appreciate it. That's my biggest fan club right there, honestly. Great. Um, guys, y'all are about to witness a really incredible panel. Um, I have a long <clears throat> list for this intro, for this first guy, all right? He is a CEO and co-founder of Improbable Media entrepreneur, investor, ESPN personality. He's a college basketball national champion and Hall of Famer. Not to mention, he is a New York Times best-selling author and a soon-to-be loser of our horse game we just put a lot of money on and one of my close personal friends. Am I right? Am I right? We, we definitely didn't just meet. Guys, give a big, warm welcome for Jay Williams. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing today? That was not good. Let's be honest. Can we do it again? Can we do it again? Wait, wait, wait. wait. You guys got to learn how to take cues. How's everybody doing today? Okay. Today is an incredible opportunity. Obviously, welcome to... Fanatics, the festival, everything that's occurring today. Have you guys been enjoying the moments thus far? I know it's a long weekend, but hopefully it's been kicked off the right way. Yeah. Let me give you some intros because I'm really excited for this panel. And we're gonna give you some intimate conversations. We're gonna talk about culture. We're gonna talk about sports. Obviously, we're gonna talk about hoops. There's a lot of unique things that are gonna come out of this conversation. And the first person I'm gonna bring up here I don't even know how words can describe this man, but I'm just gonna call him by his name and then we'll dig into it afterwards. Please give a round of applause for Dr. J. And just, just the way he walks out here, it's like he's just smooth. It's like he's gliding, right? He's still got it. All right, next up, uh, I play basketball at Duke. It's home. It's been a pleasure watching this young man continue to grow and extend his wings. He is a star in the NBA. I do think he has a legitimate chance to be the face of the NBA. I want you guys to give it up for Apollo Benchero. Next up, I like shoes. Who in here likes shoes? How are you gonna be into sports and not like shoes? It's not possible, it's not possible. Well, I'm gonna introduce the next person who's one of the realest in the game. You see his product everywhere. Give a round of applause for Dom the Surgeon. Yeah, Dom. All right, so I'm gonna address the elephant in the room real quick. Uh, Quavo might be here. He's having some technical difficulties choosing out which Cartier glasses he was gonna wear today. Um, seriously, he had some plane issues, so hopefully he'll show up. Uh, I know you guys came here to see him too, but he'll be around the whole weekend as well. But we have an incredible panel. So guys, I, I wanna kick it off, and Paolo, I'll start with you, but it's a question for everybody. You know, there were some really big, cultural, iconic moments that happened this year and sports, let's stick around basketball. So, you know, let's think around, what do you think was one of the biggest cultural iconic moments happening in sports? And if I were to give you two keys in this area, the whole Kendrick Lamar Drake controversy, 
or Kyrie, Boston, everything around that. You have close familiarity with that being a Duke guy as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously Kyrie, you know, going back to Boston was a big story. Um, I think him just, you know, reviving, I think, his career a little bit after Brooklyn, you know, going to Dallas and having a great season. Uh, you know, I think we all tuned into the finals. Um, so that was a big moment. And then obviously everyone, you know, tuned into the Drake versus Kendrick, which was uh, gave us some good music, some good songs, and entertained everybody. What you think about it, Dom? I mean, I'd say the same. But like, you know, the, the, the music was part of the, uh, sp the athletics too, you know? Like you can see LeBron rocking and you can hear everyone like playing it. So it's kind of intertwined. You know, I will say this, that um, when I think about the NBA, Doc, it's just, it moves the cultural needle more than any sport in the world to me. Um, you have moved the needle. Quick funny story, um, you know, my name is Jay. Um, you know, my mom has often talked about, oh, I love Dr. J. I'm like, huh, my name is Jay, Dr. J. Okay, just wanna state that for the record. Um, it's awkward, but fine, we can lean into it. Um, you have been part of the league for so long and be one of those cultural moments. What moment stood out to you this year considering your history within the game? Let me, let me first say, I never met your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm sure it would be a pleasure to meet your mom. <laughs> but it never happened. <laughs> you got it. We're there. Uh, I think the, there's, a, there's a number like 300 associated with a few contracts in the NBA. Mm. So from a cultural standpoint, that's probably the biggest thing that is the elephant in the room that, you know, other uh, decades and generations of, of the sport, you know, look at and we're like, yeah, you know, I mean, this is happening because of stuff that we did, you know, and they're standing on our shoulders and we want the guys who are being blessed like that to be representative in that way and to, and to know the history of the game and all the things that you know, had to transition. I, I played, <clears throat> I played in the 70s. So, you know, I mean, the country was at war as, you know, uh, Hamas and Israel are at war right now, but we were entrenched in a, in a war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And people who I went to high school with and I went to college with, many of them signed up for the military. They went to Vietnam and they never came back. You know, so from a cultural standpoint, is athletics was probably as much of an escape from the reality as anything else. And, and that escape certainly provided me with a lot of uh, comfort and understanding of what was going on around me. Do you think, um, you know, now when I watch guys at ESPN, they do a lot of like, same with TNT, a lot on the runway. Right, when guys like walk into stadiums, like I've seen Paolo multiple times, outfits that guys are wearing. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Take me back to some of those moments. I've seen you in some minks now, dog. Come on, I, I've, man. Seen, I've seen you do Come it. Well, man, you know, Clyde Frazier's the guy. He's the, he's the, he's the outfit guy. He, yeah, he, I, think he, I think he set the standard. He got a little wacky with some of them, but, but, but uh, <laughs> there were a lot of animals who were missing skin to, to take care of Clyde Frazier. <laughs> But uh, well, we had the same agent, so mm. I have to say that he was uh, definitely an influence on me, shopping with him uh, back in the 70s and, and the early 80s uh, before he retired. And, uh, and he definitely had an opinion. So I didn't go all the way, Clyde, but I went Doc. <laughs> and Doc was good enough. Doc was good enough. <laughs> Paolo, um, first off, congrats on all the success, man, that you've had thus far. Just kind of building off what Julius was talking about, you know, you have a prolific agent in Mike Miller, who I played against at Florida, He's built an incredible company with you guys. Do you guys have conversations around, and I know this is an intimate conversation, but the types of money that you can make now, I mean, watching Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum sign these $300 million contracts, like what kind of conversations do you guys have around that stuff and then still stay focused on what you have to do on the court? 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's conversations that have to be had. You know, you can't just, you know, act like that's, you know, it's not going to happen or, you know, you're just going to get signed this deal and your life's still going to be the same. You know, once you once you sign that extension, I think a lot changes. And so obviously I haven't yet, but um, just preparing for it, you know, because with that money comes uh, a lot of responsibility, you know, for myself. Uh, not only just taking care of myself, but taking care of others, taking care of my fa friends, family. Um, you know, it's just going to be a lot that comes with it. And obviously, it's a blessing, but uh, you just have to prepare for it. And uh, also, you want to make a positive impact with it, you know. Um, mm. you, you know, $300, $400 million is surreal. I, I can't even imagine, you know, having that much money. So you want to be able to, you know, leave your effect on others with that. You know, whether it's in your community where you grew up at, uh, I'm, I'm passionate about, you know, being, I'm from Seattle, so uh, trying to give back to the community there. Um, and yeah, just trying to have a positive impact on other people with, you know, the gifts that you're able to get, whether it's the money or the fame, you know, trying to, you know, share some of that with, with others. I read, when I heard you say about Seattle, it's crazy how many Hoopers come from Seattle, man. Yeah, it's a lot of us. It's a lot like of us. Jamal Crawford used to talk about it all the time, and now I just see it over and over and over. I, I do want to ask you quickly as well that, you know, what do you think it takes for you guys to make the next step? Like when I was just on first take, everybody was talking about the NBA schedule came out. We are talking about games on Christmas Day. Uh, obviously, we know we're here in New York. You see a lot of New York Knicks jerseys. Yeah. You know, Nova, Nova Knicks, right? 76ers make moves. Paul George, they're back in it. Uh, Indiana, obviously, with Tyrese Halliburton and company, Giannis. Um, you know, you have all the, the top-tier teams, Boston, obviously. People don't make mention of Orlando, even though you guys are coming. What makes you guys take the next step? Yeah, I think just getting another year of experience. Uh, I think we learned a lot from our first playoffs last year. Um, you know, we went seven games, which was – you know, to, to do a full seven game series, you know, it, uh, it helped us a lot just gaining that experience. And uh, we added some new pieces, got KCP in there, who uh, he's a two time champ. So he's gonna, you know, having that pedigree, it's gonna rub off on us, I'm sure. And uh, we just got a, a lot of young guys that are hungry. So I think, you know, everyone's getting better right now. Everyone's been working in the summer. And uh, I think next year we're gonna come in with a, with a different type of chip on our shoulder. I think last year, we were more focused on just getting in the conversation, you know, just trying to make a name for ourselves as being one of those teams that's in the, in the uh, competitive in the East. But now I think we're trying to get to that upper echelon, that top three, you know, top four, and get up there with those teams you talked about, Boston, you know, Milwaukee, New York, and uh, just, you know, compete with those guys. Mm, you're going to get there, no doubt about it. Yeah, give him a round of applause for that. He's coming. So... Obviously, I'm sitting up here with two iconic athletes. Dom, you work with iconic athletes all the time. Take me through the process of what it's like to design footwear, or to work with them. Walk me through that a little bit. Man, uh, <clears throat> it's just a blessing. Like, growing up playing sports, uh, you know, I played basketball, played soccer. But then when I just focused everything into my craft, and now the athletes reach out to me, so... I love working with the athletes because a lot of them, a lot of them know what they want, and it's like a collaboration. So going back and forth and creating something uh, unique that someone's gonna play in is just a cool feeling. And then to see it e either on the court or on the field, uh, it's uh, it's just a it's it's it's, it's, it's like surreal. Good feedback. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say collaborate, right? So I talk to athletes all day, every day especially when it comes to like those type of processes, right? Because um, Kyrie talks about this, and KD talked about it all the time, too, where he's like, yo, like, we're not hoopers, we're artists, right? At the end of the day, it's like, hey, here's a blank canvas. Here's what I'm painting on this canvas. So I, I know how that can translate, because sometimes it's like they're maniacal, right, with the process, the detail. What's the craziest request that you've ever had working with an athlete? We're like, OK, like, maybe we need to reel this back, or maybe you tried to make it happen. The craziest request, man. I don't know. I think it was the, the, the golden diamond shoe that uh, P.J. Tucker wore into uh, game five right before they won the championships. Huh. It was just a uh, $250,000 shoe. So $250,000 yeah. shoe? More than a house. Was that like one shoe or two shoes together? <laughs> it, was, so, it was a pair. A pair. $250,000. Yeah. 
Diamonds. He said diamonds. Diamonds. He's a real diamonds. Real diamonds. Not, not fake diamonds. <laughs> real diamonds. Real diamonds cost money. Yeah. So, Julius, do you think the league is kind of like missing something here? <laughs> Obviously, I mean, back in the, you know, when I was playing, it was a lot of, um, you know, during the time of AI, mm -hmm. hip hop was influencing the culture of basketball a lot. David Stern, rest, you know, rest in peace, um, really came down hard on players around that time about, you know, we are corporate, we are representation of businesses, we're wearing suits. Do you think it's good that the league is kind of getting back to being more personalized, more expressive, and, and how guys are able to dress these days considering you were able to kind of be a part of that too? I, I think it, it becomes a secondary story. You know, I think there, there was a time when uh, the league had a lot of controversies and a lot of issues to deal with and, you know, a lot of race relations stuff uh, to deal with. So, so David's uh, effort and the, the people around him, you know, just tried to encourage, well, you know, let's, like, let's make the league more corporate. Mm. You know, let's, let's, let's get on the plane, no sneakers on the plane, wear shoes, wear a suit, and, uh, you know, represent like you want to represent your parents or your family or, or your wife and your kids. And, uh, you know, I think it, I think it changed uh, the image of the league because that was an area in which, you know, they were talking about, the, well, the league is just getting to be too black. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, but when you do black and you do dressed up black, you know, you kind of look good. Whatever, <laughs> so nobody's going to look down on you, especially if you're six foot six. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, that's all part of the history, the transgression, the, trans, the, the, uh, the transitioning of uh, thoughts and feelings associated with care. I mean, if they didn't care, then imagine how bad it would be. Mm. So I think somebody caring and following up on that and then sending out the message and then getting the cooperation, you know, made for a better league. So the transition in the you know, 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s or whatever. I mean, you saw it, you know, I mean, it was, they, they, were, they were different type decades. And now when they refer back to, well, what happens on TV, I, I, don't, I don't get to see too much of anything pre-1992. Mm. And that's kind of like a network thing, which, you know, they like, it's almost like the league didn't exist until 1992 with the <laughs> Dream Team. You know, all the pros went over and, and beat the world. And, uh, but prior to that, a lot of good things happened and a lot of you know, great players are a part of the history pre-1992. And uh, you, I get into discussions with family or friends or you know, different basketball people you know, all the time about you know, why they don't really want to continue to recognize that, that era. Mm. I, don't, I don't know if you felt that at all. I mean, I, I think watch? it's, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, it's like when we have, well, I think everything becomes so polarizing these days. Mm. And what I've noticed is that when people watch media, their days are so busy. And a lot of the times the way media works is let me say something extremely polarizing and then that becomes the headline. Mm. And most of the time those headlines then go back to the dinner tables. And that's what people are having conversations about. Yeah. It's almost like we don't appreciate context or history yeah. anymore because it's not, it doesn't incentivize media to sell yeah. history, yeah. which is a little bit of the problem, yeah. you know? Yeah, the, the MTV version, the sound bite, and you know, the, the things that are associated with that instead of going in depth and detail. And, you know, relying on fact-based stuff there you go. versus opinion-based stuff. Paul, let me ask you this, because coming off that comment, obviously, you know, we just won a gold medal in basketball in both men's and women's. And first off, I mean, if you hear anybody out there, I'm saying this to everybody, if you hear anybody out there try to diminish a gold medal for our country by saying it wasn't impressive, they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Okay? They obviously have not competed at the highest of levels to actually have a chance to compete. But Paula, one of the things that happened throughout that time was there were a lot of questions around Steve Kerr, not playing Jason Tatum multiple games and some other players, Tyrese Halliburton as well. Considering everything that happens with the media, right, where that becomes the headline instead of them actually winning the game, 
How do you handle stuff like that? Like, obviously, like, you're one of the main faces of the franchise, right? You guys are taking steps. Giannis always talked about the steps toward success, right? But in the media's eyes, it's not good enough because if you don't win, you're a loser, right? So people finding things wrong with you instead of talking about winning. How do you personally handle that growth combined with the pressure that you get on from the media and fans? Yeah, I think... Uh well, I and then think also, what do you think about Jason, too, and that whole thing? Yeah, I was going to say, in his case, I mean, when you have a team with all those names, all those stars on it, uh, you got 12 guys, you know, you're going to have a lot of pressure because you're expected to win. You got the strongest team, obviously one of the greatest teams probably ever assembled. Um, so, you know, someone had to get, you know, someone – you can't play all 12 guys equal minutes, you know, so – uh, that's why I play. I don't coach. <laughs> I well, don't some know. guys, some guys play and coach. These yeah, days. yeah. So I don't know how you would figure that out. Obviously, Tatum got the short end of the stick. Yeah. Uh, as a as a star player, um, it definitely probably is frustrating in some way. Obviously, he handled it uh, probably as good as you could. But I'm sure you know deep down, you definitely have some emotions that you know you feel like you should have played, could have played. I mean, shoot, I was in the World Cup just last summer and we didn't even get a medal. Mm. So really, and, and as soon as we landed back in the States, you know, they had just announced that, you know, all these guys were gonna come back. So me personally, I felt like, man, I, we, we, we failed, I failed. You know, how we went 40 days, went to three different countries and didn't come home with a medal. And so I was, uh, I was pretty upset, not, not with anyone else, but with myself, just that we couldn't get the job done and so, I definitely, it definitely comes with a pressure, um, but I think you just gotta handle it, you know, with a certain level of professionalism and um, also a certain perspective of, you know, like when, I, when we lost, you know, I realized that, you know, at my age, I'll probably have a couple more opportunities to, to get a gold medal and, you know, redeem myself. So uh, I think just having that perspective where, you know, it's not the end of the world, you know, it's, uh, you got more opportunities and, um, just keeping that, keeping that uh, view on things. This is a question to all of you guys, because I, I struggle with it, and I'm on TV almost every other day. It's when there is this push perception of you on social media, if somebody in a very high visible you know, seat says something about you, then like, you know, social media has changed. And Doc, I'm so curious how you guys would have handled that back then or what advice maybe you have the people or how you're dealing with it now. But it's like you have all these different narratives that are out there and we're all human beings. How do you, how, Dom, I'll start with you. How do you balance not clapping back at people via social media as opposed to just grinning it and bearing it, right, and just knowing that maybe in time things will prove themselves? So how do you deal with that psychologically? For me, it's just been going through it for so long. Like, I've built my whole business on Instagram, Instagram and social media and showcased my life there and then it was hard at first and then once it keeps happening you're just like I think for me it's like there's so many different people in this world there's going to be the ones that like to uh, say something negative and then there's the ones that are going to build you up and it's building a relationship with yourself that's most important and when you can talk to yourself and continue to uh, work through it with yourself none of the comments matter I mean this morning I'm reading comments and it's forever so it's just like I laugh at it now it's the relationship with yourself that's most important to get through all of that. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the more you get invested in it, the, the farther it can, it can take you. You know, if you're on your social media, you know, searching your name up, searching your comments, just trying to see what people say, then chances are you're probably going to be pissed off by what you see, you know. And so I think one way I at least try to handle it is, you know, during if it's a tough stretch of the season or playoffs, like I don't even, you know, go on Twitter or, or Instagram, you know, because I learned, I think, I learned really when I was at Duke, you know, because you, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, you know, you know, coming from high school, you don't really deal with any of that. And then going to Duke, it's like you're in the NBA almost, you know, with the fanfare and just how, how passionate the fan base is. Obviously, you know, a lot of people don't like Duke. So, you know, you deal with a lot of scrutiny. You know, when you don't win, uh, you take a tough loss. I mean, at Duke, when, you, when we lost, we only lost like, I think, six games out of four, like 33 and six. 
And but all if you all six of those losses felt like the end of the world. It's like a national mourning. <laughs> yeah, it was like crazy. You know, coaches is pissed at you, fans are blowing you up. And so I learned at that time, like, you know, you can't invest yourself in that because during that time it was hard for me because I had never dealt with fans coming at me in that way, you know, texting my parents, going finding their social media, you know, telling them their son is terrible, you know, all that type of stuff. So it, it took me back at first, but I think once I got through that year and was able to kind of persevere through it, I think I realized, you know, if you, if you don't pay attention to it, then it, it, it won't affect you. It's, uh, it's really how much you invest in it. Yeah, uh, gener generationally speaking, I, I'm pretty much old school and I'm, you know, sometimes criticized and criticized for, you know, thinking and uh, feeling that way about current issues. Mm. And, uh, a social media presence isn't, isn't really that important to me. It's important to uh, some of the partners that I have and the things that they're attempting to do uh, with our brand. So it becomes important in that regard. It, it's not personally important for me to answer back or, or respond. I mean, I don't, I don't really uh, do things that uh, are worthy of getting criticized, but sometimes, you know, I do open my mouth at the wrong time about <laughs> the wrong thing and somebody, somebody doesn't feel good about it. Yeah. Uh, but nine out of ten times, I'm always speaking from my heart or, or from having personal experiences that uh, just led me to think the way that I think. Uh, is it a good thing? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, it helps to shape and mold the world and, and allows you know, somebody sitting in here right now to, you know, get on their phone and make a connection in China or South America or, you know, somewhere globally that, you know, you couldn't do back in the day. Mm -hmm. So there's power in that. There's power in that. And, you know, I mean, everybody wants to have a little bit of power. So if that's one of the things that kids grow up uh, gaining confidence from, gaining power from, so be it. Yeah, I think the one thing I've learned from it is that nobody really knows me but the people who are intimately around me. So everybody can have an opinion on what they or who they think I am, but they have no idea who I really am. They're just listening to the world in sound bites, right? So like, you know, I'm going to ask these guys, and I think for all the kids in the room, this is really good opportunity for you to hear advice from people that have all risen to the highest level within their respective fields. So. You know, I see a lot of kids out there, you're so focused on how many likes you get on social media platforms, that doesn't help you overall, right? Um, and that's people in general. What, Paolo and, and Doc, I think it's to you guys too, and, and Dom, I'll come to you for the last one. Like, what kind of advice would you give to young people out there that are trying to get to the highest level of their respective fields and how they deal with the fast pace media life, social media, and how a lot of their own internal reflection is based upon what other people tell them about themselves? Uh, well, for me, I got, a, I got a younger brother who's in high school, so you know, I, I try to talk to him and guide him as much as I can. Uh, and man, I really would just say, like, I think you gotta, with all the stuff that goes on, social media, um, what happens you know, in their personal life, you gotta, I think, take your development, you know, personal, you know, you have to make it a mission to, you know, whatever it is, is if it's a workout, if it's studying, uh, like you have to make sure that you're on, you know, your A game every single day and that you're doing whatever it is to get yourself better, you know, whether you're an athlete um, or a student, you know, trying to better yourself every day, you know, one step at a time, because a lot of stuff you see uh, on social media and that you scroll and see, whether it's highlights or someone, you know, doing something spectacular, you know, it all starts with, you know, them doing the basics, just like, you know, you do at home. So I think just keeping the main thing, the main thing, and, you know, never, never losing sight of, you know, the basics, you know, the basic stuff that gets you, you know, to where you are. Um, because, you know, we're all here, but, you know, we all started playing basketball by dribbling with our right, switching over, dribbling with our left, you know, shooting layups, and, you know, that's all the basics of the game. So I think just, you know, keeping it simple and, you know, focusing on, you know, bettering yourself every day. Mm. Doc? Yeah, for the better part of 50 years, uh, your question makes me uh, think about the number of 
friends who I have had who have children between the ages of maybe 14 and 22. And, you know, they asked me, would you talk to my son or would you talk to my daughter? Would you give my son or daughter, you know, some advice? And I pretty much always try to, you know, be consistent and, and give them the same advice because a kid that age, their job is going to school, mm. and getting an education and performing in the classroom. So if they play sports or they have extracurricular activities, whether it's music or library studying or whatever, then that's the extracurricular activity. But you're a student first, and I think when you start thinking of a career path, the things and the contacts that you make while you're trying to be, as, as Powell said, the best person that you could be, the best student that you can be, if you, if you go after that you, you, and you succeed at that, then you'll succeed at other things that you target and you go after, mm. which might be more closely associated with a specific career path. But, you know, deciding at ninth grade that you want to be a professional basketball player, that's stupidity to me. It's not, the pros pick you. You don't pick the pros. Mm. <laughs> they pick you. So you become the best player that you can be and aspire to be the best ninth grade player that you can be, but putting all your eggs in that one basket, it's fool's gold. Mm. <clears throat> Dom, I know we only got about a minute left, but like, you know, you're, you sit at the intersection of sports and culture more than anybody on this panel. What do you see changing in the next five to 10 years that you think is gonna stand out as a chance to be differentiated? Well, I'm gonna go from 74 to 79, so. <laughs> I'm going to lose a lot of my audience, <laughs> just Your like, audience just like Joe audience. Biden did. They were like, oh, no, you, he's, he's too old. He's forgetting stuff. Hey, bro, I forget stuff a lot. Let me tell you, it, it comes, <laughs> comes with the territory. <laughs> so I think Powell's going to have to answer that question about the next five years because yeah. you know, he's going to be in the trenches going at it. I'm going to be out. God willing. You still going to be I'm going to be, I'm gonna be out gonna be and here. about. I'm, I'm still going to continue to make my mark. I got you. But, Dom, go ahead. But, you can answer but, it real quick. But, but I, I think it's grandiose <clears throat> as his. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just think that, you know, so, well, first off, the social media is a tool, right? So use the tool for what it is, for connection and getting, you know, if you're posting, like, what is it that you're posting for to connect with family <clears throat> or to show your art or to show your skills, but, you know, use it as a tool. Don't let it use you. And, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the next five years, I think it's going to continue to have athletes, you know, be, you know, show themselves outside of just the, the, the sport, right? And it's continuing to do that, but which is tough. How do you be a pro athlete and, you know, role show model. and, model. yeah, and a role model and, you, you know, you're into fashion and you're into, you know, whatever it is, you want to build a brand. So, it's a lot, but I think there's going to be a lot more of that, right? Athletes showing their personality even more through uh, creating their own products and shoes and, and, you know, and just showing more about how they think. I have one last question for you, Paolo. Um, I want you to finish this statement for me because I think it says a lot about how you look at life. We are in five years from now, Paolo Bencaro is what? Uh, NBA champ. Orlando. <laughs> yes, sir. NBA champ. Uh, hopefully an MVP, and uh, yeah, one of one of the faces of the league, one of the you know faces of of, of basketball, of the new new generation. I, I guess I'm part of the new generation. <laughs> so yeah, I would say yeah, just all that. And he'll be wearing the $4 million shoes in the championship. Maybe so. <laughs> well, I hope you guys have That's enjoyed good, the conversation. I want you guys to give a round of applause for Dr. J, Dom the Surgeon, and Paolo Bencaro. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>